Do you want me to talk to you as Joe, as yeah, I'm sure. talking? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that feels more comfortable to me. Yeah, you bet. I'd like that. <laughs> uh, well, Joe, the question was, how did I get started in the seed business, or more particularly the seed corn business? And uh, that's a result of the history of uh, our family in the Dust Bowl years. Uh, my father got started uh, in the legume business, alfalfa and clover, because nothing would hold the soil except those deep-rooted legumes. They'd also produce nitrogen for the soil. So there was nothing could be raised on our little 80 acres of ground. So he took to the road and went and traveled the Platte Valleys, clear on out to the Colorado line and and uh, anything north and south, <coughs> excuse me, where there, <coughs> excuse me, where there were river bottoms and could grow these legumes, and uh, eventually was able to buy a fair amount of the uh, seed from the farmers, and to the point where he had to find a, a place for it. Uh, not too many were had any money in Nebraska to. Kansas to buy seed of any kind so he said I got to create a market and he went back to, into Iowa and Illinois and developed seed outlets uh, to other seed companies there <clears throat> so he created quite a business selling alfalfa and sweet clover from the all over the uh, western part of gathering seed from the western part of the Nebraska and taking it back into Iowa and Illinois. As time developed uh, and we came out of the Dust Bowl years, he kind of liked the seed idea of seed business and so he decided to wonder what to sell to stay in business when the, it started raining again. Well, the universities of the various Midwestern states were developing a little item called hybrid corn. It was in its infancy then, but uh, he said, you know, that had potential if we ever get rains here again. So he became friends and uh, with a number of university developers and decided that uh, since we had a farm on the Blue River, he could maybe raise some hybrid, that's newfangled hybrid seed corn on some of the good uh, ground near the Blue River. Well, it took off, of course, and he said, you know, there could be a market for this uh, if it ever starts raining again. Well, that started us in the seed business. And uh, he continued to develop his uh, contacts for alfalfa and clover as a method of keeping up uh, income coming into his seed business, but he really wanted to get involved in the hybrid corn business. Since it was still in its infancy, it took time for him to uh, get land that he could irrigate and raise a little bit of it, and it took time to develop contacts to start selling it. Well, all this transpired and the Lauber Blue Valley hybrid seed corn business was born in the early 40s. Uh, most of the production was done in the Blue River Valley to begin with because that's the only place it was wet. Later on, uh, the rest of the state of Nebraska decided that there was actually water here underground <clears throat> and they started putting down deep wells for irrigating above the ground. Well, this was a natural for corn production because corn wouldn't grow unless you had a positive source of water. So as irrigation developed in Nebraska uh, and all over the Midwestern states, he said, uh, I believe there's a business for a new business in hybrid seed corn. And <clears throat> varieties improved. And in the early 1940s, more specifically probably in 1942 and 43, uh, he decided to create a plan called Lauber Blue Valley Hybrids, which was basically hybrid seed corn. And with a small acreage, he started and it developed 
because there was no one producing hybrid seed corn, first of all, and secondly, hardly in Nebraska and Kansas and, and uh, Iowa, at least the western part of Iowa. So he was able to develop that business, and that started the hybrid seed corn growing plans of, at that time, he used the Lover Blue Valley brand. Well, fast forwarding considerably, it uh, was successful. He developed a number of dealers in Kansas, Nebraska, and uh, a little bit in Iowa. And uh, my brother Clayton and I grew up, and we helped service these dealers along with paid uh, district men who would talk to dealers and set them up and so on. So we got started in hybrid corn. Uh, the history of hybrid corn through the Great Plains is, is many fold. Many names came up. Many companies sprung up uh, in several states in the Midwest. Uh, hybrid seed corn was a, a big thing. There are a number of large, giant hybrid seed corn companies which still exist. Uh, we kept going through a certification program in the Nebraska uh, Certified Seed Program. And with that certification symbol, we were able to sell certified hybrid seed corn to other states in the nearby states, Kansas, uh, South Dakota, Iowa. Uh, we didn't get into Colorado too much because it just the land changed out there when you got away from the rivers. But along the river valleys, uh, we had dealers scattered all through the areas. These were personal dealers of ours. Uh, it was quite good to us. Uh, demand uh, in some years exceeded supply. Some years we, in a good production year, we had enough to supply the dealers we had. We expanded probably in the neighborhood of, at one point, up to 60 or 70 dealers in the Midwest. Now back in the 40s and 50s, that was a pretty good saturation. And a few dealers even in Kansas. But through that time, a lot of com name brands were associated, uh, we were associated with, and others <clears throat> in the hybrid seed corn industry continued. However, we continued to produce, if not for ourselves, for other companies as well, under their labels. It's not commonly known, but it was a fact. It helped us take on extra land and produce seed that we needed to have physical facilities, dryers, detasseling groups, all the things that go with the production of it, so that we could sell larger amount other than through our own dealer organization. Well, that's just actually a cosmetic idea of how hybrid seed began and was sold in Nebraska. Uh, we were an early part of it, fortunately. Uh, we've gone through uh, a number of uh, organizations to sell our production since then. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a very good ride. Uh, a lot of the people who started with us uh, are no longer producing, but uh, that, I guess, is to be expected. We just didn't know any better and kept on producing hybrid seed corn, and fortunately, we had a market for it. Uh, <clears throat> through the years, I've had several cases where if they saw Lobber Seed Farms on the tag or Lobber Brew Valley Hybrids, whatever the case might be, uh, I never had any trouble selling to them. Many farmers would say, hey, we know who you are. You don't need to tell us. And that was pretty gratifying for a little farm boy that didn't know anything and growing up and trying to talk to dealers. And uh, he put me on the road when I was 16. And I said, Dad, I don't know anything about this. And he said, you like to drive, don't you? I said, oh, you bet. He said, get out there and just talk to the dealers. You're a farmer, they're a farmer, you'll get along fine. And he was pretty much right. 
I loved talking to him. We had the same language. And uh, so we've been pretty fortunate. We've been through a number of other uh, brand names, which I won't go into now. Uh, now we're selling back on our own name again. Uh, my boys are actually taking the lead in it, uh, which I have four. And three of them decided to be part of this operation, which is pretty good average, I guess, or pretty bad average for them, I don't know what the case may be. But anyway, it uh, has evolved to where we now do not have a brand that we want to market as such. We are blessed with a, a large wholesale uh, business, which actually, so far anyway, we've been able to sell all that we've produced and has caused a tremendous increase in production capability, and this is primarily because of, of uh, my three sons, at this point anyway. That's the only one still surviving. But they sell internationally, and our main business is to ask major or minor seed corn companies what particular specific variety they want increased and all of our production is ISO, internationally certified, so it can go anywhere in the world. So with this capability, and that has not been easy to attain, I might add, uh, there aren't many with that capability in the Midwest. Yes, there are a few, but not many. So we feel very fortunate and uh, I guess because we've been able to expand the production uh, says that there may be, in fact, a market out there for that class. So we do not sell under our label anymore. We sell for other companies. <clears throat> and the tag on it is an international certification, I-I-O. If you buy a bolt or a nut, there will be I.O. on it, which means that that bolt and that size is an international recognized symbol. Uh, I.S.O. on seed production indicates that it is produced with a recognized, rec accepted, verified set of rules. So any company in the world can buy it or ask us to produce for them. That's, uh, I don't think we ever envisioned we would see such a wide market for our products grown in Geneva, Nebraska area. So it's, in a way, it might be considered a Horatio Alger stories but it's taken three generations or more for us to to get even to that point. And it hasn't been without its problems, as anyone might expect. Uh, we're very proud of it, and we, we're very jealously guarding anything that might deviate the acceptance of the product in the international market. That's a, that's a quick resume of, of where we came from and where we're at. Uh, uh, I'm 82 at this point, 82 and a half. Uh, I never expected it to happen in my lifetime. And uh, I don't much know how much farther it can go, but I have four boys that are probably going to find out. <laughs> Hold on one minute here. As much as I, I could. Anything I left out that you think I might be of interest? I think that was about it. I think it really was. Cool. Yeah. But I mean, I'll be glad I, if you give me a topic, I'll talk <laughs> forever. There's a whole bunch of things you had to invent along the way. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it's not 
Uh, oh, you, you can put this in as an addendum or something if you like. And some of those. Maybe your dad did also. Well, I don't know about a gadget, but, but some of the inventions are still very evident in the machines that we purchase today. They're not inventions, they're innovations. Uh, what are some of those? Can you name them? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well. The, the idea of hybridization, are you rolling? Mm -hmm. The idea of hybridization in a corn plant is that uh, you make the plant, which is both male and sterile, you modify it to where it is either a female or a male plant. I.e., if you want it to be a female plant, you pull the tassel. If you want it to be a male plant, you discard the ear. So having said that, it's, it's pretty easy to hybridize anything in corn simply by uh, actually removing the tassel or not. And the ear is still there to capture whether what you want it to be. So, gee, that was easy. So all you gotta do is cut, pull the tassel out or cut it off maybe. Well, IE ushered in the, the uh, era of mechanized detasseling. We used to use literally hundreds of boys and girls, young boys and girls, to pull the tassel out to make it a producing plant. I think at our peak, we probably had, uh, I remember, one peak, we had eight school buses every morning of approximately 40, 40 45 people or more. And so I don't know, it's two or 300 people. Uh, that's an interesting logistics thing in a small town area yeah. to get uh, six school buses full of kids from the various communities around. It's a big of the yeah, certainly not all of them. You don't get them all, but a big percentage of each community. And I think we ranged as far, far away as about 45 miles away for the farthest bus. But that was quite a, an exciting thing to see three or 400 kids in your field at seven o'clock in the morning ready to do a job that you didn't think anybody else in the world wanted to do. And certainly I wasn't crazy about it, even having grown up with it, but anyway, that was probably the highest peak in, in uh, pulling and then since then of course it's been mechanized you can pick and choose what you want in it. Uh, fortunately it's become mechanized to the point that instead of uh, having to pull the tassel out and we even had high clearance rigs that kids rode on to pull the tassel out that was mechanization to begin with but that evolved quickly. Okay, if you had a high clearance rig going through there, why didn't you put something on it that would cut the tassel off? So then we went to cutters, just little high lawnmowers. Mm -hmm. Well, that evolved to uh, some genius in the in the east come up with, Let's, why don't you put on war big washing machine rollers and roll them out gentler on the plant. Mm -hmm. We went re evolved through that, all mechanized which was really great. Anything mechanized, you know, to get rid of all these kids. Uh, and you can run a machine 24 hours a day if you want to. That's right. Yeah. So, wow, hello, here's a brand new type of invention. It has evolved to, you saw some machines today <clears throat> that still go over their high clearance tractors, still, my, I might mention they're air conditioned and and cabbed and everything yeah. <laughs> today. But anyway, their high clearance tractors are going four wheel drive and they have magnetic sensors 
that are controlled in air-conditioned cabs, hydraulic height of each row <clears throat> to where if Mother Nature grows one taller or shorter than the other one, you can, you can adjust each row within a given thing and the, will electronically get rid of that tassel. Some cut it, some burn it off. There's a variety of ways, but they electronically take it off. Most common is to still to cut it off. Some of them prefer to roll it out. If you have a gen. You guys had both there. Yeah. It depends. Sometimes we're, we're working on very expensive inbreds increasing those. Uh, they like the rollers. It gently comes in and pulls the tassel right out. Uh, if it's a, a highly productive commercial variety that's been out a while, it's just as economical to cut it out. Right. However, roller is always better. But so we have all these different types depending upon what we're asked to raise anymore. Sometimes we're asked to raise the, the parent inbred lines. So you have to treat it entirely different. So we're equipped to do all of those different stages that we're, that there's a market for. Uh, I don't know whether that's too common or not. I, I think not, perhaps. Uh, in other words, we've adapted to where, what do you want produced? We'll produce it. How much of it do you want? Uh, if it's enough for us to take a hold and, and create bin space for or dryer space for, we'll do it. If it isn't, we're not in the business to do uh, work that we may need some of this, produce me a little bit of it. We're, we're, we're geared for quantity production, high volume, high volume yeah. and very accurate production of it. So it's, a, it's moved to a point that uh, I never expected to see. <clears throat> Have no idea where it's going in the future, but, future, but it'll probably always be better and more selective. Uh, we still have equipment which is very adaptable to anything that can be raised in quantity merchandising wise <clears throat> and if we don't have it uh, my boys say which handle it all now uh, we can get it done for you we can have it made we can get it done uh, they have they know what it, the parameters have to be to get it raised so I think if it's physically possible and somebody can dream up something that will do it where no one else's can, I think we'll probably have it done. Uh, the acreage capability has expanded. I don't know what our capability is. It continues to grow. Well, we were saying earlier today, you guys this year produced 7 million acres. Oh, that's what the seed will produce. Right, right, right. The seed will produce 7 million acres. Of yeah, it's not that much acres of production. No, obviously not. <laughs> uh, but we're in an area of uh, guaranteed irrigation capability. Uh, pivot irrigation has been around long enough. It can become very precise. Uh, modern technology of soil is very important. Uh, we have been blessed with a number of people in various states who have accomplished understanding of soil and production in it to a very high degree. Uh, we've had people, uh, since we rent a lot of ground to put this production on, have ground sold out from underneath our rental <clears throat> for the next production year. <coughs> and the boys tell me invariably, if we farmed it l very long, that the new owner will say, what have you done to that ground? And we smile and say, I don't know. Well, the answer to that is very complicated and very, we've learned lessons over a number of years. <clears throat> and 
And we do things to that soil and to the crop that are not common farmer applicated situations. <clears throat> As a result, since our goal is a very, very expensive product off of that ground, that we can well afford to do things for that ground to improve it that the average farmer could not economically consider. Now that gives us a very interesting edge on any ground that we can own or rent for a period of time to build that ground up because we know beyond a shadow of a doubt what it will produce and it will probably outproduce any average ground around it. Yeah, and we kind of insist on irrigatable ground because you can't put all of these qualities in Fillmore County, Nebraska, for instance, who only generally gets the right amount of rain without irrigation. But if you can apply, if you have irrigation available, then you can comfortably, and you have the, the probability of using that ground for a while, then you can start building the organic and I really think that's the key word, but the organic, but certainly the chemical level of production on that ground up to a very, very high point. Um, I don't know whether this goes on camera or not, but I'll tell you one thing. In the history of Fillmore County is clay ground, little, sub, sub, little top surface ground and then clay down for 10 feet. Well, now that's not ideal ground to grow anything on. Uh, that's why legumes grew well here. They went down and they broke up that clay ground and allowed other roots to go down there. Okay, well, you can't do that to thousands and thousands of acres. So what you do is you let microbes and soil fertility agents and chemicals, balanced chemical agents and microbes do the work for you. And this takes a period of time. But once accomplished, uh, most farmers consider the value of a soil sample by the amount of organic matter in it. Most universities do too. <clears throat> so the object is to let the proper balance of fertility and microbial action, and I'll just group them together there. If you can let them and Mother Nature do their work faster than they would normally, you got an edge. And in essence, this is what gives us, we feel, an edge. And uh, we've got it down to truly a science, an agricultural uh, organic science. This has happened through trial and error and much, much help from many, many people over probably 40, 50 decades. So it didn't come to us overnight or anything. It's a result of a lot of trial and errors and so on. Uh, my dad brought the first, this is irrelevant, I guess, but my dad brought the first carload, train carload of ammonium nitrate, nitrogen, into Fillmore County on rail. There was nothing like, there, it was there before, but it wasn't available commercially. So one way or another, we've been, we've been in the business of trying to improve farming and farming practices and farming ground itself for, uh, I don't know, close to, close to, 90 years. Because I'm, I'm ready, to, uh, I'm over 80 and, and uh, they did it long before I was around. But anyway, but it's been fun. Uh, it's been a treacherous, it's been a treacherous, 
I don't know what to say. It's been a very difficult time. Uh, irrigation come in when I was, uh, became possible when I was about uh, 12 years old, 10, 12 years old. Irrigation? In Nebraska. As in pivots? And As in deep well irrigation. Uh, okay. uh, pivots didn't come along until probably uh, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago in any quantity. Before that, it was uh, you dug a hole. The first irrigation well lobber seed farms had was done, done, dug by hand with a post hole digger. Wasn't, needless to say, it wasn't very successful, but it was done. And it was used for a month or two or a few months, one season, I guess is what I was told. And uh, <clears throat> The technology of maintaining the hole improved considerably in those early years. And uh, in other words, uh, five or 10 years later, the university developed irrigation well was perfected. And of course, from then on, it was uh, a boom. The county, I, I don't know how many irrigation wells Fillmore County has, but deep, deep irrigation wells, but a lot. Uh, my dad was on the, uh, time-wise, was on the beginning end of it. When he realized there was a layer of irrigation water down there, if you could just tap it, boy, you know, it was like a kid to candy. There was no stopping him until he finally figured out how to master it. Uh, and some of his neighbors uh, in Shickley who are have drilled most of the irrigation wells in Fillmore County and a lot around are still the descendants are still there uh, and still some of the biggest well drillers in the area. So it was just being in the right place at the right time. But uh, for, for us, it has been uh, an opportunity to expand when we had both the knowledge in seed production and the irrigation potential here. It's worked out well for us. I've enjoyed it. It's it's uh, sustained me to be able to always do something better because technology and seed production, along with the God-given right of water and the knowledge of fertility, uh, has has uh, contributed totally to the success of, of our business here. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it and I'm happy to have lived through it and, and uh, I'm uh, grateful that the good Lord has given me some sons to help carry it on and of course they're into into uh, improvements that I can only shake my head at and say, well, I wished I had those 30, 40, 50 years ago, but I didn't, nor will I ever. But uh, uh, I think they are now selling internationally, ISO certified, internationally certified. Uh, I, sup I would guess that they or their offspring or some major company will continue the process uh, and probably in this location, although there are lots of places in Nebraska that it could be accomplished, uh, Nebraska still is blessed with irrigation water. Uh, it's the reason that a big uh, plant was put in north of here or next to Fairmont. Uh, which takes corn and distills it and makes ethanol out of it and they use a tremendous amount of irrigation water, what we call, farmers call irrigation water every day to make ethanol. Yeah. And you've probably seen the stack, smokestack oh, yeah. uh, just about five, six miles from here. Uh, I don't know what their output is daily, but it's huge. There's uh, rail cars stacked there. 
that are at least uh, a half mile long all the time. And semis, uh, tankers going in and out, hauling it on the highway. So yeah, I, you, can't, you can't pipe ethanol. Is that the deal? Yeah, you can't put it through a pipeline. Is that right, Dad? Yeah, it evaporates. Must be correct. It evaporates. So I don't know how long that industry will uh, hold. I suppose as long as the water will hold. Uh, um, if we lose the water, we're going to lose the capability to produce the hybrid corn that they're using too. So I suppose the whole thing will stop. Uh, I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime, but uh, that's contributed not only to our success in producing hybrid seed corn, but other industries as well as what I'm suggesting. And I suppose in some small way we might have a historical something to do historically from making the two products available and at least one product available here and and around geneva nebraska it's given me a good life a good life for my family uh i don't know for how many more but uh, uh i wore out two knees and a hip walking in fields to detassel them or rogue them. <laughs> and I'm still going, so I guess you can replace those things. <laughs> but uh, it, it took a lot of, uh, there used to be a lot of hard work associated with it. It's much easier today. It's mostly mechanical. And uh, the uh, even the, if even if it uses personnel to ride the, uh, and it doesn't anymore, they do it automatically, so I guess that's out. It just doesn't take the uh, number of kids that it used to to produce a hybrid plant anymore. Although many, many areas in the United States still use young people to do it, I'm sure it will be a vanishing thing because technology is taking a hold and making it uh, impractical. In other words, which would you want to buy a very expensive high clearance machine to do your detasseling or work with several school buses of, of young people? Well, I think the choice is relatively easy there, but uh, and of course there aren't, even if the choice weren't easy, there just aren't as many young people interested in going out and walking all day in mud up to their knees and then going home just so tired they can hardly walk up to the door so that era I think is probably over but it's been an interesting one it was a good job for kids because it was really one of the best jobs available at the time I don't know about today but it was a it was real. Oh, and it's time. You consider coming out of the uh, well, you could be 40s. You could be 14. Yeah, consider we come out of the uh, war years. There weren't a lot of jobs for young people. Yeah. Uh, if you're on a farm, you had all the work you could get, but yeah. the kids in the city had to work, look for a job. Right. And boy, we took them all. Really? Yeah, that's what Brad was saying. Well, <laughs> yeah, that, well, okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, there's an alternative, yeah. Uh, and I don't think they, I don't think anybody wants to pay 20 some bucks an hour. To, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, that wasn't the case. Maybe I was well, just no, there was, he was saying there was an incentive oh. for ones that were doing the job well, but I think it's a far. Well, I, he was, I think, and I'm just picking up because I heard the same thing. I think he was talking about some really high, either college kids or somebody really physically capable of coming in and uh, running up and down the rows of teams 
and doing a an adult job of that that selective detasseling and and there are inbreds which are shorter than the normal tassel we work with and they can come through those because they're at the normal human height and they can be very selective and if they're young college kids that are really energetic you know and and yet capable why boy they can take a team of those uh, and and come in to select fields and just do a wonderful job by hand and get back on out and get paid a very very good salary for it I think that's what he was referring to but anyway you get enough that's all I need all right thank you yeah, thank you, very much. you thank you for considering it worthy an old man's going on worthy of a recording I I just shooting a breeze but anyway uh, it is a part of history in the Midwest we uh, we dad had a thousand detasseler kids when I was before I was going to high school he had a uh, grower that had a lot of kids in the area it's a Mennonite area I don't think I'd want to be quoted on that that's not a good connotation but uh, Mennonite and Catholic and uh, it was up area north of York uh, and he got a thousand kids to detassel some production up there when he found uh, we used to sell seed corn way back then that's what dad did he raised little bits of seed corn and sold it locally and he had a farmer up there that uh, was irrigating out of one of the rivers up north of York and it's really good ground up there York County has always been better ground Fillmore County ground anytime and uh, of course he had a seed business in York so he knew a lot of those people up there anyway when it became possible Dad knew from selling these seeds in the East that seed corn was a good thing if you could just get a bunch of it produced. And lo and behold, here were these people who had a lot of kids, good hard-working kids, and it rained up there all the time. It didn't need irrigation wells like it does down here. And I don't know how many acres he had, but he had a thought, I suppose he'd have to have about between four and five hundred acres of production and that was unheard of back then unheard of by any major seed company but he saw all that and put it together and he had he said several times he had over a thousand acres uh, I guess it was over a thousand acres he had a kid per acre but it only happened for a year or two uh, back in the early 40s that was I don't think Pioneer had that anywhere and I don't know what he did but I think he sold the seed corn uh, to his seed dealer contacts in the east which is where corn was grown hell you couldn't you couldn't sell the production off of a thousand acres anywhere in Nebraska that I know of they didn't have the water to produce it. Anyway, it's been an interesting yeah. period in my life. I would sure as hell wouldn't want to go through it again. <laughs> Once is enough. Once is enough. Yeah. Uh, if you go through the top part and not the bottom, that'd be all right, babe. Uh, I, there's a lot of interesting sidelights, but I lost with the antiquity of everything else. But I sometimes I'm surprised at myself because I, Louise tells me this from time to time. I'll 
talk about people and periods and what went on that are indicative of the area, but not too relevant to most people. Mm -hmm. And yet they're an integral part of the history of this area. And not that anybody would care at all. That's just so it's not in my mind worth preserving verbatim, but uh, It's uh, quite interesting. Yeah. It's it's been fun. I think that's all I need. And it's created a living for us. <laughs> I don't know where in the hell the boys are going with what you saw this afternoon. Yeah. I'll tell you there's some there's some technology there in production that Boy, I don't know where in the hell they found an outlet for as many acres as they grew this year mm -hmm. of seed production. And they, it seems like they're taking over the, the scale of what NC Plus was as a cooperative. Oh, <laughs> you know, because they're selling. It's way beyond. I I I I don't want to sound, but it's way beyond that. Uh, uh, first of all, NC Plus never produced that many acres with all their growers. Yeah. Uh, secondly. Uh, Paul, we're talking about, and, and I have trouble getting my hands around this, but we're talking about producing uh, on inbreds that are much more tough to get to produce a decent ear with decent quality corn on it. Uh, and uh, that takes a takes a very high, sophisticated rate of uh, way of, of production, and uh, they don't they don't have perfect production on everything because of it. But uh, it's the average. Well, the large companies have farmers grow most of their ground because they don't own ground. And uh, they they look it over pretty carefully before they decide to put seed parent on it to increase. But there's only so much bottom ground or there's only so much highly productive ground in around certain areas. My point is they have to be able to get the highest yield off of their low producing inbreds in order to make it worthwhile to spend first of all the cost of the seed and secondly all the hand pollination and the hand work that goes into to creating some of these things and uh, and we're talking about inbred fields in other words not straight seed production like the boys are doing but inbred fields and that Jesus that's expensive to produce that seed it's bought by the kernel, and in order to make it simple, it's so many thousand kernels, and they may pay several hundred dollars a thousand kernels. <laughs> Yee, Christ, you know, well, that gets it up to where it makes some of this stuff possible to to do for it, if that's if it's worth that valuable. But that's some of the things that they're they're being asked to produce is some more seed stock for other companies 
That's what some of these inbreds are. Yeah. 